So, welcome again to this uh, next lecture on of this course on cognition, emotion and transformation. Till now, if you have followed the, the talks, you would have noticed that we were talking about placing the self in the society and how the biological influences and the neurophysiological influences uh, affect behavior how the brain works at both unconscious and conscious level and uh, how the cognition and emotion interplay to create behavior which is the ultimate reflection of the thought process, how the concepts of normalcy and abnormalcy have evolved over time and how the societal rules and societal upbringing including the mythology, religion and everything that goes into the head makes an experiential world out of which the conscious mind has to create a meaning and a sort of story to keep you pushing. So, the mind may suddenly get very hassled looking at the so many inputs and so much activity going on even in a single head what to talk of 7 billion people and there are people all the time as the time flows all this rooted in the larger universe and larger space and time. And we ended up with a prototype, not a case study, but sort of discussion on a peculiar situation of what is morally right or wrong and extending it to this situation of addiction, where the actual cause is still ambiguous and the expectations are also ambiguous in the sense that. Uh, When you talk of addiction and I am just recapitulating from the last lecture, that people are expected to transform, people are expected to change and that brings in the question that they have a control over the change. That means, they have a will, they have an intent and they have the capacity to uh, alter the addictive behavior. On the other hand, what neuroscience is talking about and most of the neuroscientists believe that there is no will whatever happens to the conscious mind is just a, a, a projection of what the unconscious mind has already decided. So, is what is the trick then? Is there a possibility of somebody uh, applying his will or the intent to change it? And that brings in the big question of, well obviously, will operates in a, at a very, very conscious level unconscious will does not mean anything. The will may not be free as uh, the neuroscientific studies uh, uh, make provide a model for understanding, but uh, still if is there a will or it is all deterministic decided from the unconscious, the unconscious deciding from the, exp the experiences which is having through the sensory organs, whatever the input goes. So, ultimately the big circle uh, where the man is just moving according to the circumstances and the whole information which is processed in a very, very hidden unaware way. So, let us let us look at this and because this is the most crucial question that in fact, if you ask me next two lectures will depend whether we are able to sort it out or not. Because when we are talking about the third part, we have talked about cognition, we have talked about emotion, their interplay, we have talked, we have placed uh, them into the circumstances, but we have not talked of transformation. Because transformation hinges on this link between what we have and what uh, we have understood how the brain function and what we can do, and that link is will, and will exists in. Uh, a conscious mind. So, the big question is, is the mind trainable? Because it has larger ramifications as if you remember I told that the psychiatry may believe that uh, people who have addiction are ill, but they do not believe with full heartedness. So, they, they have, we do not have effective drugs till now. 
So, what we do is we also tell people to keep changing and that is the state of affairs with most illnesses that uh, even, even you talk of rehabilitation, where does rehabilitation, it, it cannot be done by a, a medicine. Medicine can cure symptoms, but when the symptoms improve, one has to push oneself to readjust into the mainstream. That again requires certain amount of will, whether it is a collective will or a will of family member or will of a patient. Even if you are recovering from depression and if you remember I talked about help and treatment. So, you can isolate people, treat and send them back to, but even sending them back and getting back to normal life requires certain amount of will and so is help. Whether the help can be done in isolation or it should be done in the mainstream where the person is living is, is a question which. Uh, so, let us look at this whole issue of whether there is a will and see whether we can link it to oh, what we are going to talk about that is transformation and the whether the conscious mind can do it. So, the big question is that whether is the mind trainable as I said or can consciousness. So, let us have a brief look at the understanding of what consciousness is understood as. This is from a paper which is mentioned here. The power of the brain would not be to generate consciousness ex nihilo, not out of anything, nothing, but only to bind, focus, accumulate and bring to self reflection the all pervasive given expression, right, within a coherent situated knowledge. So, there has to be a coherence and a binding of all that is going on into your head and these are accessible to the brain. But we can, as it says, we can have very interesting arguments in order to explain the parts of human consciousness such as self reflection. So, obviously, the consciousness is not a unitary thing, but this is a very interesting concept. What is consciousness? The, if you remember one of the uh, pictures which I showed you from uh, one of the cognitive psychology books, I will show it to you again. The two parts consciousness is the light, there is a access consciousness which is sensory and reflexive, you do your reflex action which is the soft problem, we know the physicality of it, somebody touches you with a pin and you withdraw, that is a different type of consciousness, you can know that it goes to the brain and it is a sensory thing, what emerges out of it is the awareness of that pain and these are defined by the neural correlates of consciousness. But this is this all, because even if there is a pain which is a feeling of pain which has emerged from uh, uh, this pain getting into your skin, David Chalmers calls it a soft problem and a hard problem. Is the experience of pain same? That experiential consciousness which is a part of self, that is difficult to explain and that probably uh, makes everybody unique. And uh, although even if you define certain qualities of pain or a touch or a smell, still people will have different experience and that is the hard problem of consciousness. Whether it is a primary thing or secondary to this, we are still debating and obviously, as I said that forms the self, what is the uniqueness in your personality. So, I mean this is just by the way whether there is a huge one single consciousness like Buddhist belief. Buddhist believe that there is one single consciousness which is separate and a lot of religious people and um, uh, spiritual philosopher believe that there is a single consciousness pervading the whole universe and brain is just an expression of cosmic consciousness and whereas, the elementary particles and all they all go on to and the time and space is actually connects. So, there the flow of the time actually creates the cause and effect that is what creates past and present and future, uh, but there are a lot of debates in that also till we come out with a conclusive model. Before we talk of putting in some conscious effort to transform and change, to have a will we have to know 
what is it all about? It is a, is it an electrical pattern, which the, we know about the electrochemical firing or is it a magnetic field around it? We know there is a, where there is electricity, there is magnetism also or it is something unknown. The mechanism of our ordinary knowledge is of a cinematographical kind. Oliver Sacks is a very famous writer. And what is cinematography? The backstage is unconscious. The selective attention, we talked about a camera like attention where it, which you can focus on. So, even if to focus that uh, attentional mechanism or that camera within onto something of your choice, it still requires some amount of will. So, selective attention controls the spotlight that selects what will be open in the bright spot. This is consciousness and this has a limited capacity. So, a consciousness is like a light which can at a, at a given point of time or within a time frame has limited capacity to pay attention to. And what is happening is, so the backstage is unconscious and the audience is unconscious. What you know is the limited capacity through the attentional mechanism of conscious mind, which obviously has to give meaning to whatever is coming as we talked in, in one of the previous lectures. And uh, whole concept of awareness and choosing, because it has a limited capacity, so it, if you go back to one of the initial lecture where it says that the human mind actually cannot multitask. And th this is the reason why it cannot multitask, because of the limited capacity of this attentional mechanism. So, you may be actually doing many things here and here, but at a given instance it will be this. Where is it coming from? Whether it is coming from this or a decision is something which is still not clear or maybe it is clear we do not know the mechanisms for it, the reductionist mechanism, this picture you have seen. So, this is a conscious bright spot on the stage, intentions equate it to will, whether it is free or not. When I am saying it is free or not, it means that possibly the unconscious mechanisms uh, create it. It is a creation of the unconscious again. So, if it is a creation of unconscious, it is still not free. Perceptual, all that goes through the senses. Expectations is actually what your story has made and self is also a story which your mind tells. So, all this goes in, all this is interpreted here, a composite picture is made thrown to this within that 200 to 500 milliseconds of uh, rather snapshot and then there is a behavior. So, this is like a theatre model, again the same thing to explain, there is an unconscious executive function, there is a workspace, and there is an unconscious visual special things happening, memory verbal phonological consciousness visual special. So, when you are actually speaking or um, try this small experiment and you have to pull you put your intent into that. If you speak any word there are two things happening in the brain say I say pen. Now, one when I am saying pen there is one process which was going on at the phonological level to again start from the beginning. Why did I choose pen? Because this was my immediate contact. I could have cho chosen a rose or a duster or a mouse, but out of this thing I, the mind had choice, but I did not put deliberately into choosing something. Uh, and when I said word, I said okay fine you choose a word and then I said pen because this was the immediate thing. Now, whether this was intentful or willful, at this point of time it was not because I did not give it a thought. But now if I say again I have to choose uh, something else, not, now I am putting my intent into choosing uh, a glass, a glass of water. And when I am saying a glass of water, two things are happening. There is a like a visual sketch pad, this pattern of glass is being sketched in my mind in a visual sketch pad. And at the same time, 
the brain has formed this word and already transmitted to be spoken. So, you can split any any spoken word into its visual uh, counterpart also, but normally we do not have to pay attention to all this because the brain has evolved that intelligently the brain has really evolved to keep all these things under wrap because if so much data has to be analyzed every second it the, it will become well nigh impossible for one to live. So, the again the same question we come to does the conscious act only on the behest of unconscious or the intent of will has a separate existence does the will once initiated further modifies the deeper processes or is bound to with it without an independent existence the awareness of attentional motivational effective mechanism is will or intent. So, if we go back to this slide is this will a product of all this unconscious which it goes back to co becomes conscious and then comes back in a feedback or is it independent independently can it alter this or alter the unconscious this is something which is still undecided because if we look at the philosophical angle and what people uh, believe uh, they will say there is a will obviously a man can change himself but the neuroscientist would not say like this he would he would say even the the desire or intent to change comes from the man himself from the unconscious processing and from the unconscious uh, binding of the, um, the experiences which have gone in. So, again those experiences are coming from external circumstances. So, it is all linked. So, in deep they would say that will does not have a independent existence and it is all related and whatever the unconscious mind is throwing and the man has no will. But that raises a very, very peculiar situation. If there is no will and if people have no control over what they are doing consciously or if their intent also is arising like an involuntary wave from within. So, this is conscious, this is unconscious mind and uh, so if the whole thing is like this then where is the word called responsibility because then the obviously the justice system will fail and it will fail simply because then everybody will say that neuroscience has proven that uh, I have do not have an independent will I do not have an intent and I can think only what my unconscious mind is throwing at me and so it uh, so be it. So, whom will you punish? and then everything will crumble because why are we teaching the kids what we are teaching are we teach then anybody can question that what you are teaching the kids in the school in a given system uh, is not the ultimate truth then there may be an, an alternative by which you can condition their mind. So, that if you keep take different kids in different environment which is a fact also and they grow up they will have a different value system their right and wrong will be different from somebody else's and they, they would have no will over what they want to do or what they want to transform and then whatever they do will be ultimately blamed onto the culture and culture obviously cannot be punished. So, where is the fault of the human being although there are some universals which biology has brought till till the human beings share this common genetic pool and common genetic unfolding of mind and brain till, till that time uh, obviously there will be common right and wrong not in the sense of morality but what is beneficial for survival but beyond that it is all hazy then the something what is a crime somewhere may not be a crime somewhere else depending that we have we have not been taught or your mind has not been conditioned all education is after all uh, making layers of knowledge which has ultimately layers of conditioning. So, who is going to answer this question? So, however imaging and other 
neuroscientific uh, explorations uh, bring out, this debate still has not ended. Like the debate of artificial intelligence and the risk uh, an intelligent machine was posed to existing homo sapiens. So, let us examine this, let us leave this debate for the time being and assume that to transform we need a certain intent and a certain will. This you would understand if we are able to see these two slides. What is the difference between change and transformation? If you understand this, then probably we will be able to answer this question of where is whether conscious will intent is involved, whether there is a or it is just all in the hand of a cyclical unconscious where there is no responsibility. Because obviously, when you decide to do something, you have, have to own a responsibility and you have to have a accountability about it. Whereas, if it is all a deterministic system where the unconscious mind is deciding and it is a conscious will or intent is a emergent product of uh, the unconscious, then obviously, there is no accountability. Our justice system, education crashes. So, we do not agree this, but we do not agree the other either. So, where is the gap? The gap is probably in between understanding the difference between what is change and what is transformation. Change normally is sort of involuntary. It is largely pressured by this external thing, external circumstances change, all the time we are changing, our mind is changing, our neurons are changing, environment is changing, there is so much change going on, no two movements are same, no two people are same, no the same person in two movements is not the same. Uh, so, that, but you do not put your real brain to it and you do not want to control every change which is happening and we just flow in life. This is sort of involuntary and by the external pressures. Now, it is largely transient because as I said the change is so fast and so much that it can uh, by the time I talk to you the next sentence some change would have happened in the air, in me, in something. So, it is like flipping in and out. So, there is a change you may feel, you may not feel, you keep moving on and it is a largely a process of adjustment. A adjustment again we if you remember we talked of uh, the assimilation and accommodation in the theory of Piaget. So, adjustment is something which we need to do with change, but then what is transformation? Transformation is not really change, it is a change, but it is not that transient flipping in and out, changes, change seems to be superficial dependent on the external thing, it can come up, go down and same things may be cycling again, but transformation is more deep and enduring. It requires a certain amount of assertion of will. That means, you have to decide goals and needs from within, from transformation has to come from within. It may get triggered by external circumstances, but it has to be from within and it requires a considerable amount of training of mind. You remember I showed you the first uh, in the first lecture picture of few people, all that what was happening that uh, the, the handicapped person going up to Mount Everest, the Nazi forces doing all that. Uh, so, transformation need not necessarily be good or bad, it can be both ways and uh, it is not necessarily morally superior, it can be bad, but let us talk, let us focus to the, the one which is beneficial to most people. Process may be the same, after all a terrorist also trains in some mountains, dry mountains of Afghanistan, 
leaving all the comfort of their life. They could survive in small bread and butter, but they would go and do and uh, create all that mischief. So, the end product of anything may be detrimental, destructive, but the process may be the same. So, it requires a considerable training of mind, army people, police, sportsmen, doctors, anybody, anybody who is who has decided to do something, even if you have decided to get selected to a good institute, you have to train your mind. So, training of mind is the baseline, there may be a trigger which may be starting it. After that, you require a consistent hammering into your mind, you just cannot say, okay, I have transformed, wonderful, I have decided to transform, tomorrow I am different and then you go along with your tagging along with your life the way you are living, it is not going to happen you have to do consistent hammering of your brain. So, once you have a decided goal, you decide about the training of the mind, do a consistent hammering, compare it with the transitory nature of and the flipping in and out of change. So, transformation is the creation and change of a whole new form, function or structure. So, transformation is not only, it can be very, very physical in, in the engineering, in the construction, in the uh, people know how to transform a garbage can into beautiful flower vase. People know how to convert, how to lay a beautiful uh, smelling garden over a, a stream of dirty water, but people are also known to convert a devil into scent and there are so many examples of it. Valmiki in from our own culture was a decoy. We went on to write Ramayana. We know a lot of criminals who transform, but we also know of saints who transform to criminals. You just have to pick up a newspaper and then you will know. So, devils converting to saints, we know, but we also know saints converting to devil. So, again that is a change, a change is transitory, one off thing. We talked about bribe and all that may be a change, but if you get into a habit of it, so it is a creation and change of a whole new form. So, all transformation is change, but not all change is transformation, because change as I said, change are more transitory episodes of, uh, of change of something different largely driven by external pressures and they you keep changing and you largely involuntary unconscious, whereas transformation can be a change which is more sustained, requires a continuous hammering, training of mind and over and above you require an intent to do it. I will end at this and uh, we will continue this in the, in the next lecture, looking into this difference of change and transformation. Thanks.